And then, um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read your little bio on the back of the book, but I'd love for you to fill in any updates or book information that's not there. Okay, sure. so um, so Gail, my dear friend, who is such a generous literary champion and wonderful writer that I've been just so lucky to know for many years. Um, is the author of Fruit Flesh, Seeds of Inspiration for Women Who Write, and the novels The Book of Dead Birds, which won the Bellwether Prize for Fiction. Is it a so literature of social change? Is that the word? Yeah, that's that's how it was first worded. I think they're calling it the literature of social engagement now. Oh, okay. And that's Barbara Kingsolver started that. Um, Self-Storage, Delta Girls, My Life with the Lincolns, and she's got... I, I want to say you have more than one collection of poetry. The Selfless Bliss of the Body and, oh, I know it's on my shelf somewhere. Tell me the name of your most recent one. Uh, Many Restless Concerns. Many Restless Concerns. There it is, yeah. which is, tell us about, a little bit about that. Sure. This is a novel in poems um, that's written in the voices of the girls and women who were killed by Countess Bathory around the turn of the 17th century. Awesome. And the evolution of that book is very much, <clears throat> excuse me, connected to my memoir. So I'm happy to talk about that oh, later. Awesome. I love that. All right. So um, and then, of course, The Art of Misdiagnosis, which is her memoir. And that is what we're sort of here to talk about, though Q&A might go in any direction. So, Gail, um, I'm going to turn it over to you. We talked about she she's going to lead us through a writing prompt at some point and talk. And then we will get to ask her some questions. All right, my yeah. dear. Thank you so much, Jordan, for having me. And thank you all for being here and reading my work. And I'm, I'm just so very grateful. Um, this book was the hardest and most necessary book I've ever written. Um, when I look back now, I feel like it was the book that I had been trying to write for a while, even before my mom's death. Um, but she had given me explicit instructions to not write about her while she was alive. And I absorbed that advice <laughs> very deeply, so much so that it was hard for me to write about her even after she was gone. But I look back now and uh, realize I started writing novels around the time that her delusional disorder first surfaced, which was around the time of my daughter's birth, she's 27 now. And um, you know, as I mentioned in the book, her delusions were kind of framed by my giving birth. They started at least that I was aware of after that birth. And then she took her life right after my youngest child was born almost 16 years later. Um, but after my daughter was born, fiction just kind of started gushing out of me. And I really didn't know what to do with it. I've been writing since I was four years old. Um, my first, and I'll share what I, I wrote as my very first poem because it feels like it provided a template for my writing life. Um, my first poem was called Little Wind. And it went like this. Blow little wind, blow the trees little wind, blow the seas little wind, blow me until I am free little wind. And you know, just a simple little ditty um, you know, not, not a, a big special poem or anything, but I look back and I think that I understood even at four years old that writing could be, or creativity in general, could be like this wind that can blow through us and make us feel more free. And writing has always been where I felt most free, most brave, but it was hard for me to, to tiptoe, you know, toward writing my own story. And I think that fiction just started gushing out of me um, after my daughter's birth in some ways because I didn't know how to face my own story. I wasn't sure how to, uh, you know, how to even think about um, my mom's delusions and what they meant and everything that it brought up. And so I started turning toward other mother-daughter stories, I think, as a way of maybe subconsciously processing some of what I was going through. And then after her death, I knew I had to write about her. I knew that that would be the only way I could really make sense of our past together and to try to process her death because writing is just how I, you know, make sense of things. Um, but it took a while. 
you know, it's, it's scary to write our hardest stories. Plus I had just given birth. So I was dealing with all of the postpartum healing and stuff, and also dealing with the memory loss that can come with both grief and with birth. And so I had this kind of double whammy with my brain, which felt very fuzzy for a long time. And I think that somehow, um, some part of me knew that that would happen. And I had the foresight to take some notes during my mom's disappearance. And then once we found news of her death, because I wanted to remember that time, I knew it was going to be important for me to, to know what happened. And I'm really grateful that whatever part of me knew to do that did. And, you know, I slowly found my way into the writing. Um, I wrote the scenes that were most pressing to me, which weren't really the hardest scenes. It took me a long time to write the hardest scenes, such as, you know, just learning about her death and the really charged time right around then. Um, you know, so I, I, I would write these scenes as they bubbled up and I would write them down and they would create space for new scenes. Um, the form of the memoir took a while to discover. I, um, I wasn't planning on weaving in the letter to my mom, which was started as an assignment from my therapist who suggested I write to my mom as a way of being able to still be in conversation with her to be able to ask her the questions I wasn't able to ask her in life. It was a fabulous suggestion. It was so helpful for me to write to her. And I kept writing and writing and writing to her. And at some point I realized that perhaps if I were to weave this letter into the memoir, it could be a way of providing context for our history together, since what I was writing was really just the, you know, the present tense narrative around the time of her disappearance and death. And, um, and so I realized that that could give grounding. And of course I had to edit it because I wasn't writing it for an audience at first at all. And so, um, you know, had to make those changes. And at some point, I had already decided to use the name of her documentary, the documentary she was producing around the time of her death. I had already sort of poached that title, The Art of Misdiagnosis, as the title for my book, because I felt like it resonated on so many levels, uh, you know, regarding our relationship together and issues of physical and mental health and diagnosis and all of that. Um, but I hadn't thought to actually weave in transcripts of that documentary until quite late in the process when I was invited to a women's writing retreat at this um, former hospital, which is supposedly one of the most haunted buildings in America. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to this retreat again next month because we're all vaccinated and we can do that again, which is so exciting. Um, it was a three-day retreat. I told myself I would bring my mom's documentary, which I had not watched since she had died. And it was mostly her just talking about her artwork and the various illnesses that she thought were in the family that um, were addressed in these art pieces. And I brought my son's little... Um, portable DVD player and told myself if I feel ready while well, I'm there, I'll watch it. And as, about as soon as I got into my room, I thought, okay, I'm ready. This is the right time to do so. And as I started watching this documentary, I realized that if I transcribed it, it would give my mom a chance to speak for herself within the memoir. And I spent really the whole retreat just transcribing and weeping <laughs> and not doing much writing, but it was so necessary for me to spend that time with my mom and her voice and to see her moving around on a screen and to realize that that, that could be an important part of my story, you know, giving, giving her that space to speak to. And so, you know, it took a while to find the right form and it can take a while for us to find the right shape for our story. Um, once the book found a home, I was asked by my editor at Beacon Press to cut five to 7,000 words, um, just so it would be cheaper to print. Beacon Press is a nonprofit press that's been around you know, since the 1800s, and it's just a fabulous press, and 
she she said I won't give you any um, direction at this point about what to cut and we'll do the intensive back and forth editing after you've cut this many words. And at first I thought, how in the world am I going to cut five to 7,000 words when each of these words were so hard won? I fought so hard for every single word, had to wrench them you know, from my very bone marrow. And, um, uh, but once I started, I realized what all didn't need to be in there. And I thought this was a finished book. It was sold as a finished book, but <laughs> somehow I had this epiphany as I was, doing my revision um, that the central sort of question or the or theme of the book wasn't what I thought it was. So sometimes it can take a while to figure out what the true core of your book is. Um, I thought that the core of the book was my kind of breaking my own silences and finding my own voice, which is an important part of the book certainly and was an important part of my own process. But I realized that the core of the book was my relationship with my mom and trying to make sense of it. And anything that didn't feed that central theme could go. And it was important for me to write it for my own knowledge, my own processing, my own understanding of my own story. But I realized that the reader didn't need to understand all of the things that I needed to understand. And um, I'm a big believer that, you know, the, the early drafts are for yourself and the revision is for the reader. And so I realized, you know, I could let go of all the stuff that didn't have to do with my mom. That was just about my own journey. And I ended up cutting 20,000 words. Like I, I cut it by like a full quarter. And it was a much better book as a result. <laughs> and none of those 20,000 words were wasted. I'm grateful I wrote all of them. Some of them I was able to craft into standalone essays and they have their own life in the world. Others, you know, only a handful of people will ever have read them and that's okay. Cause they, you know, they took me where I needed to go. So nothing we write is wasted. It helps us learn, you know, as writers, it, uh, it helps us learn about ourselves. Um, and if we have to let it go, I think it still is like this underground spring that nourishes our work and ourselves. Um, and that was a good, <laughs> a good lesson for me. Revision used to be something I hated. Uh, it used to be really painful because it felt like cutting off, you know, a piece of my own body sometimes. And cutting those words that were so hard one ended up feeling really freeing. And it helped me realize that, you know, I was making the book stronger. That's what revision is so good for is honing our vision and, um, you know, just really um, sharpening it and making it as tight and as clear as possible for the reader. Like not in a dumbed down way, but just in a way that is focused and, and makes sense. And so, you know, I had to kill a lot of darlings but they, they didn't truly really die, of course. Um, and yeah, the whole, the whole process was one that was, hor you know, horribly hard at times, but also incredibly cathartic. Um, during one of my events after the book came out, I was asked whether I saw the book as catharsis or art. And I'm usually not a person who can just like think quickly on the on the fly in public, <laughs> um, but I I just immediately said it was both. It's it's catharsis. It's I kind of wove those two words together, and you know I, you know like I talked about those early drafts were catharsis. It was just and catharsis just means purge, and it was purging the story from my body, getting it onto the page, and then the revision was all about the shaping, the art of it you know, crafting it into to something that was hopefully beautiful and um, lasting. And so it was both of those things and it, it needed to be both of those things for me. I know some memoirists will say that writing is not catharsis or is not therapeutic. And, you know, everyone of course has their own experience, but for me, I did find great healing in writing this book. Um, I started writing it with a lot of anger toward my mom, which is very common after a suicide. Those feelings of anger um, can be really overwhelming. And so I, that's 
that's what was really churning in me as I started it. And by the time I finished, I felt like I burned through that anger into a place of compassion. And compassion sometimes is harder than anger. It hurts more. You know, a broken heart doesn't feel good, but it also did feel good. It felt better than the anger to me because I felt like I had come to a place where I was able to love my mom in a more um, simple, less complicated way. And I'm so grateful for that. I feel like, you know, writing this allowed me to see the amazing sides of her, her visionary creativity and belief in herself and, you know, things that I could learn from. Um, so I'm really grateful for that journey that this book took me on. And it helped me feel too more whole as a person because it helped me feel like my insides and outsides could be more congruent, more of a piece. Cause I had held so much inside for so many years. Um, and just being able to say the things that had been kind of, you know, locked up inside of me, um, that was really, really helpful for me as a human being. Um, one guiding light for me, and I, I brought up this quote because um, it helped me so much and maybe it will help some of you too. This is from Audre Lorde, who was an incredible writer and thinker, poet and essayist and um, just amazing woman. And this is from a speech she gave, uh, the transformation of silence into language and action. And this helped me so much when, um, when I felt like maybe I couldn't go on with this project or needed a, a little dose of bravery. And um, uh, just in mentioning bravery, I, I often uh, will think about uh, the quote from Brene Brown's talk on vulnerability, which is wonderful if you haven't seen her TED talk on vulner vulnerability. And in it, she says that um, an early definition of the word courage was to tell one's story with all one's heart. And I think that's, you know, the courage that we need as memoirists. So, um, so this is a passage that gave me courage. And this is Audre Lorde again. So she, and, the, and she had cancer at the time, I should preface by saying that. So she, she said, in becoming forcibly and essentially aware of my mortality and what I wished and wanted for my life, however short it might be, priorities and omissions became strongly etched in a merciless light and what I most regretted were my silences. If I was going to die, or I was going to die, if not sooner than later, whether or not I had ever spoken myself, my silences had not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. What are the words you do not have? What do you need to say? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die of them still in silence? And of course, I'm afraid, because the transformation of silence into language and action is an act of self-revelation, and that always seems fraught with danger. But my daughter, when I told her of our topic and my difficulty with it, said, tell them about how you're never really a whole person if you remain silent, because there's always that one little piece inside you that wants to be spoken out. And if you keep ignoring it, it gets madder and madder and hotter and hotter. And if you don't speak it out one day, it'll just up and punch you in the mouth from the inside. So I just love that so much. And I would often ask myself, like, what do I need to say? What are the words I do not yet have? Remind myself that my silence you know, was not protecting me or anyone, even though it sometimes feels like it is at times. Um, and I think breaking through silences, um, yes, I will definitely share that with you by email, Jordan. Yeah, um, you know, when we keep our silences, that can create so much shame, so much stigma about, you know, things that we've been scared to talk about, such as suicide loss. Um, suicide, you know, just talking about suicide is still hard in our culture. And I have heard from more suicide loss survivors than you know, I could count it, that have told me that their families told them not to let anyone know there was a suicide in the family um, because it would bring shame on the family somehow. And that just breaks my heart because 
I think it's the silence that perpetuates that stigma and perpetuates that shame. And when we talk about things, whether it's mental illness or physical illness um, or, you know, loss, um, things that aren't spoken about in, you know, quote, polite society, um, that's when we can change the, the bigger cultural story uh, because, yeah, the silence is not helping anyone. It's just helping people feel alone and feel shamed um, or feel shame. And when we speak our truths, when we speak our stories, especially those that have been sort of shunted into the shadows, we totally can change the larger cultural narrative and you know, help release people of, and ourselves of that shame. And um, so it's meant so much to me you know, to hear from people who have said that my telling my story has given them courage to tell their own story. And I certainly have gotten courage from other people being honest in their writing over the years, like Audre Lorde, like Roxane Gay, Lydia Yuknovich, um, so many <laughs> over the years you have given me permission to tell my own story. Um, so that was a lot to throw at you, but <laughs> I just wanted to share um, my journey with the book. And you know, I'm happy to answer questions or shall we jump into the writing exercise now? All right, so for this writing exercise, um, this is one that I like to give people as a way of, uh, you know, helping you trust your own instincts as a writer. This is uh, an exercise that um, came to me several years ago and I enjoy continuing to use, um, especially during allergy season. I don't know if any of you are having like just really intense allergies right now. I definitely am with all the pollen that is finally out in the world. Um, and so as someone who has had to deal with severe allergies in her life, um, I was really inspired by a trip to the allergist once where I was given scratch tests. And for those who don't know what that is, they inject little bits of different substances under your skin and then see whether you have a reaction to them, see if you're allergic to them. And I looked at the list of the categories of substances and I'm going to write them down just so you have them handy. Um, oh, let me see, hopefully I remember them all. There might be more, but this is what I remember. So the categories on the list were food, weeds, trees, grasses, mold, and home. And what I'd like you to do right now is take a look at this list and test your reaction to it. So see like, you know, which one bubbles up in under your skin as a way of providing like a, you know, some sort of reaction, which, which one of these words makes your heart pound a little bit or made you sort of stop breathing for a second. You know, that word has the most charge in it for you. So I want you to choose that word, whichever one you had the biggest reaction to and use that word as your prompt. And you know, how, whatever you choose to do with that word is great. If you want to, you know, write a list poem about all the trees in your life, or if you just want to do, um, you know, just free writing about whatever word speaks to you the most, um, however you wish to approach it is great. Um, and how long, Jordan, do you think we should give people to write? Um. Okay. Seven. seven minutes oh i'm unmuted um seven minutes How, what do you guys okay. think that's about okay. what we usually do for a prompt okay, okay. yeah seven minutes sounds do, great you want to set a timer or should i i will okay great and i'm just gonna run okay. and get a glass of water real quick but i'll be right back. okay all right so seven minutes starts now
All right, the timer is going off. So please come to uh, some sort of resting place with your work if you haven't yet. Right. Um, would anyone like to share what you wrote or share what your experience was like with this exercise, if you don't want to share the actual writing? Sometimes I just call on people, which I'm happy to do. We have shy, we have shy folks, but they're actually love reading. <laughs> okay, Rev, okay, I see your hand going up. Remember to unmute yourself too. Right, right, right. I just did. Yeah, I wrote the list. Home just came to me. Home, it's been different at different times. From love to fights to loud noises to animals that I can hold in my arms and kiss goodnight. It could have started by I it could have started by running away from my parents' home to marriage, but it's it's run the gamut. Learning by marriage that I loved. And learning by marriage that I love, that I was in love with long before I could define what I wanted, what I liked, what I needed, to children, which I craved and couldn't love enough. Finally, after forever in one stage of my life, following the silent leader, my husband, I was set free to, to find my way to redefine my core, to reinvent my destiny, to start to stand tall by myself and celebrate new art, new feelings, new homes, new companions. And that when I, and that's when I birthed my grandchildren and found happiness. Suddenly I was supported by my, by my down chain friends and, and passersby who filled me with inner peace that shouted loud and clear in my waning hearing, you are okay, you are enough, you are lovable. Beautiful, thank you so much for sharing that. What my a journey point. you took us on, thank you so much. Well, it's, it's the core of my memoir. Beautiful. Who's thank that? you. <laughs> oh, Natati, you feel me? <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, food is the word that resonated with me. Uh, sustenance and poison, stress and relief. The pleasure of food is gone, replaced with the burden of survival. Macronutrients, net carbs, protein versus sugar, fiber versus sugar, fat versus sugar. Sweet blood knows only boundaries. I now know about more about food than most physicians, but it never keeps their eyebrow down, never keeps their judgment at bay never allows them to remember they have two ears and one mouth for a reason. No one listens to fat women. Food is the thing I get judged on first, how much, what kind, and in what ratios. Food is the thing most people assume need to be monitored, fixed, altered, reviewed, gauged. What was once a sweet comfort, a chosen treat, a delicious evening spent with friends, is now a minefield of do's and don'ts, of have and have nots. No one likes to do their crack alone. When it comes time to socialize with food, the list of things I can't have could make up its own decadent menu. So I'm that person who brings her own and my body is such that everyone peers at my plate, wondering why, if I'm so careful, does it look the way it does? So powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh my goodness such beautiful rhythms to your writing mm -hmm. too thank you so right. gorgeous thank you lovely um who else is feeling it let's see sometimes i can engage it how about stewart how about stewart <laughs> okay <clears throat> so like rev home my walden my shangri-la my place of refuge. From the day I first saw my home, I knew this was where I wanted to be. One walk through with our realtor and I wanted to buy it. This was very uncharacteristic of me since I am one who likes to be sure before I make a big move. But in this case, I told my wife, I want to buy this home. Now, after 17 years here, it is all I could ask for. I am at peace here, both inside and outside. 
Big Sur has been my spiritual refuge for many years. And in this, and just this past year, my home has taken over from Big Sur. Mm -hmm. The emotional energy I get every day from just being here is like an electrical charge, similar to my plug-in car. Except in this case, I don't need to go anywhere to have adventure. While the pandemic has caused much pain and suffering, it has provided an opportunity for me to fall in love with my home even more. Lovely. Thank you so much for sharing that. And how wonderful that that just sort of re commitment to home or re, re falling in love with with that place has been a gift of this last year and it was fun to hear about you speaking of home just where we can see into a little window into that <laughs> home and i love it this is that writer way of the little sign behind you <laughs> oh, yeah. a very good friend of mine recently gave me that along with uh with this <laughs> Thank you. Oh, <laughs> that's that's cute. Great. oh, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, just the the peace and comfort that home brings came through so clearly. Well, I think we have time for maybe one or two more quick reads, and then we want to ask a few questions of Gail um, before we head on to do our critique. So two more volunteers or one more? Anyone? Or none? <laughs> oh, Tia. Yay. I'll do it if no one else wants to. Oh, go for it. I'd love to hear it. I did weeds. Um, often you find weeds and cracks, broken places, loosened soils, dusting crevice, dusty crevices. By definition, a weed is simply an unwanted plant. Potato, potato. A weed is whatever you call an intruder, an unworthy, or something unloved. I believe weedy thoughts planted in memory can find a crack and take hold and distract me and blur my, my vision. Anytime the surface of a moment is disturbed, weedy thoughts seem to easily seed in the galleries of grief, trauma, and pain. But what if I tended the weeds like I do in my garden? When overwhelmed physically at their removal, I found it easier to throw an edge on them and declare an intended planting an edge, soothes a viewing. The frame allows a moment to be contained. The weeds take on a different characteristic when tended. Perhaps all a weed needs is a frame of love. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love just where you took that metaphorically and yeah, so lovely. Oh my goodness, what a treat to hear all of these. Awesome. Well. I think this is a good time for um, those of you who've read the book and anyone else is welcome to stay just for a little bit longer to ask any questions of Gail that came up for us as we read it, as she talked. Um, and if you're feeling shy, you can type it in the chat and I will ask her. Um, but we had a pretty good discussion. I, I particularly enjoyed what you were you were talking about finding your form and how how you went about that. And I know we've talked and uh, we've done lessons around sort of trying to find that structure which is so hard to do at sometimes. And sometimes for some people it comes easily, but not for everyone. So yeah. anyways, any, any questions that are outstanding for us folks? Yeah, Natani. I have two, both of the answers are fine or just pick one, but um, one, um, when you're writing about another family member, how did you navigate how other family members would deal with that and then to um did you with the form of the writing um you were talking about braiding it and that you hadn't set out to do that was that kind of an epiphany moment of oh i need to braid this or was it this gradual did you write it in, in pieces and it became braided thank you for those questions and yeah they're they're great ones um writing about other people who are alive is tricky and fraught and especially with my sister, um, she had such a hard time knowing I was writing this book. And she um, came to visit me at some point and we had a very tearful 
painful conversation where we were both lying on the bed, like just looking into each other's eyes and bawling our hearts out. And she, um, she told me that she felt like my choosing to write this story was taking her agency away and felt like an act of violence. And that was so hard to hear. That was tremendously hard to hear because my sister has been my best friend since she was born when I was four years old. And we've, you know, always been very close. And she, it was just really hard knowing that I was writing this, but we, we kept talking about it. And I, for a while I stopped writing the book because I, I couldn't after hearing that from her until I got to the point where I realized I'm just gonna write this for myself. Even if no one else ever reads it, I know I need to write this thing. So at some point I found my way back into it and then once I had finished a draft, I shared it with her. And it was, I think the unknowing of what I was actually writing was scarier than seeing the real book, seeing a real draft. And once she read it, she told me that, you know, she understood that I was writing my experience, that I wasn't claiming to say what her truth was. I was just sharing my own truth. And she ultimately gave me her blessing which was wonderful and I'm so grateful for it. Um, she even came, you know, flew out to an event that I was doing on the anniversary of our mom's death that was like a mile away from where she had died. So it was a very charged event. And just having my sister in the front row, being able to look out at her and make eye contact and know she was there for me and with me made all the difference in the world. Um, and I, you know, I know other friends who've written memoirs who've had family members stop talking to them for a while. It's, you know, you have to figure out for yourself what risks you're taking by sharing, um, you know, stories you've shared with other people. Um, but for me, ultimately, I, it was just something I had to do. And I'm really grateful that she ultimately gave me her support. I shared these early drafts with just a handful of people who I gave veto power to. Her, my husband, um, and my two older children. And she only asked me to change, my sister only asked me to change one sentence to make a bit more specific about her because she was worried it could be read the wrong way. Um, but she didn't ask me to remove anything. My husband asked me to take out one line that he was uncomfortable with. Um, that took place during a hard time in our marriage. Um, my daughter said it was hard for her to read certain things, but she didn't want me to change anything. And my older son didn't read the book until it actually came out. He just, he just didn't get around to it. And he said he trusted me to, you know, to write what I needed to write. And so I'm, you know, grateful that that they, they did all give me their support. Um, I think if any of them had told me not to put the book in the world, I wouldn't have because their you know, presence in my life is more important to me than the book, but I knew I would have written the book anyway, just not shared it. Um, and of course, you know, we each have to make our own decisions as far as those matters go, but that, that was my journey with, with writing about other people. Um, as far as the structure, the braiding was something that came about um, sort of over time. Um, I was writing these various pieces, but I had no idea how they were going to fit together. And what I did at some point was print everything out. I had what felt like, you know, maybe all the pieces, the, the moving pieces, but I just wasn't sure how they fit. And so I printed it out. I, I um, separated into stacks of scenes. So I just had these stacks of scenes all over the floor. This was before I had a puppy, so it was easier to do that then. Um, and uh, I just moved them around and I tried to think like what scene will speak with what scene. And, and it felt to me like um, it was many more than 15, but there are those, those games that are called the 15 game or called something like that, where you have the different sliding tiles and you have to slide them around to get them in the right order. And actually a friend of mine, Leah Woodall wrote a beautiful memoir using that as, as her form um, for the memoir. You know, this came out 
you know, after I had gone through and thought of that, uh, that metaphor um, for the process, but it really felt like just shifting them around until they found the right order. And once I found that right order, there had to be some revision in terms of finding transitions or realizing where I had left holes and needed to plug in a different scene, things like that. Um, I also realized that I could kind of curate the, um, the transcription of my mom's documentary more. I just had the whole thing in there before. And then I realized that, no, I only needed to have, you know, the most resonant pieces. Um, and didn't didn't need everyone to be able to you know witness the full documentary, um, so there was a lot of tinkering once I found that that order. But yeah, it was just a lot of shifting and moving and piling things up and restacking them and all of that good stuff. Those are great questions. Thank and you. Answers. Thank you for answering that. The the, the braiding of the essay is one of my favorite. Uh, or the memoir is one of my favorite things about your book. I really, it's, a, it's it reminds me of basket weaving instead of watching a tennis match. Like I never mm. feel like I'm being jerked back and forth. Uh -huh. It feels like I'm, yeah, on this oh, part you. of this piece of art. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Natani. Yeah, Stuart, do you have a question? So um, thank you. I, I do have a question, which I'll get to in just one second. Uh, but first, I just want to say thanks for writing the book. I was one of those people that Jordan alluded to that blew through the book. Uh, I couldn't just read 40 pages. I got into it and uh, it sucked me in. And it's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your description early on about how you navigated to get to the true essence or whatever you called it of the book. Um, I've been struggling with a memoir I'm writing and have recently found that what I started out with wasn't the true story that I'm supposed to be telling. And so that's helpful to hear. Thanks. My, my question is, um, in, in your writing and the memoir where you have dialogue, what, what is your technique for putting dialogue in um, where in my case, and I think most of us, our memory service okay, but it's not perfect in terms of dialogue. And I was curious from your vantage point, you know, what, what is your technique for putting dialogue in? Yeah, thank you. That's, thank you for all your kind words. First of all, and um, thank you for that question, because that, that's a really tricky one with um, writing memoir, writing creative nonfiction is trying to recreate dialogue that may have happened decades ago. Um, and for me, it's really a matter of trying to put myself back physically into that moment as fully as possible um, with all my senses, with my whole body. And of course, you know, part of that whole sensory experience is, is hearing and um, yeah, just, um, yeah, just taking in what other people are saying. And so I, I tried to, you know, either through meditation or just sitting with it, um, try to bring myself back into the moment as fully as possible. And of course, you know, I don't have tape recordings of things other than my mom's documentary. So it was a matter of getting to the emotional truth of the moment, even if the words weren't word for word exact. Also trying to remember how, you know, how the people in my family speak, the rhythms of their language, stuff like that. So, um, so their words will sound like their words even if it's maybe not 100% accurate, I've, I'm still trying to capture those rhythms and capture the essence of what was said. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, that's helpful, appreciate it. Thanks. Any other questions? Even if you haven't read the book, if you had a question just based on her copious experience as a writer, you're welcome to ask You know how she might approach something you're grappling with. That's always good to hear. Um, anyone else have something? It's hard to think of something on the spot. Um, I have a comment. Yeah. You know, uh, relating to Stuart's question about, um, you know, talking, you know, the dialogue. The other day I, I came across a, di a scene that I knew that I, I did not remember any of the dialogue. But I remember the scene and I remember that it was critical to the, my story. So instead, what I did was what you did, create the emotional arc, create the emotional moment, 
thought, well, what would I have done in that scene had there not been conversation? And I, I knew it was hard to, for him to say what he needed to say. And at the end, I, I wrote the whole scene without ever saying anything. And then I remembered an acting coach words that sentence that, that ran through my, my head. It's not about the words, it's about the emotion. And wrote it just like that. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, alluding to the emotional river that ran under underneath and all, all that needed to be said was said and we were set for the next scene and that was it. That's great. Yeah, I, li I like that point, Gail, you made about the emotional truth, which I think is a really key piece that creative nonfiction writers and memoirists have to draw upon. And it's also, of course, always our emotional truth. We're not speaking for anyone else. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to know, so I off, I've had people ask before, when you're writing about a difficult experience where someone else looks, you could say looks bad in their behavior. So let's say you, you, I'll, I'll just might use my own experience. I grew up with an alcoholic mom. I love my mom to pieces. Her struggle with alcoholism has been painful. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. The parts of it that intersect with my own story, when I write about them, I'm really conscious of not wanting to appear um, judgmental. Like I want, I, it's like, how do you write about these experiences in a way that reveals what happened but isn't passing judgment on the person's behavior. Do you have any insights on that? <laughs> I know it's yeah. a big question to like throw at you. Oh, and it's an important one. And yeah, thank you for that. I think I'm trying to remember who originally said this. Um, it might've been Chekhov. Someone said, you know, when you get to the, these tough scenes that are full of heat in your own, um, you know, heart, um, to write them cold, not, not, you know, like cold emotionally necessarily, but just to, to try to get the, the details down with as much clarity and objectivity as possible. Um, to just show what happened um, without the scrim of judgment. And, and then I think sharing, you know, keeping the focus on your own truth, just like a therapist will tell you, you know, if you have trouble with something that someone has done, use the I words, like say, mm -hmm. you know, I felt this way after you said that or um, things like that. So it's more about owning the internal experience rather than blaming the other person. And, um, but it's, it's tricky. And especially if it's someone we, we love and we don't want to show them in a harsh light. And I think, you know, it's often said about memoir is if we're going to show someone in a harsh light, we also have to show ourselves in a harsh light that we have to implicate our own, you know, not so good behavior <laughs> too. And, um, you know, not, not come at the writing as if we're some perfect angel shaking our finger at other people, but allowing the full humanity of, of all of us to come through. And I think if we share ourselves and, and those in our lives as human beings, you know, who sometimes make uh, maybe not the greatest choices, um, but we can see their humanity. We can have compassion for their humanity and empathy for their humanity. Um, then it will come across as being less about judgment and more about just here we are as human beings trying the best we can. Yeah, that's great. I love that. I like. It's almost like um, you have to be a reporter on the facts of your own life at first in order to get it down, like just the facts. <laughs> and then you can kind of go back in and poke in the emotion. So I like that a lot. All right, well, any other last questions before we let Gail back to her life and um, we move on to our critique part? Oh yeah, Simon. Well, I just wanted to say thank you to both of you. This has just been so wonderful. I'm definitely going to read that book. I'm from the thank other you. class just sounds absolutely wonderful and I did have the, the very questions that Natani and Stuart have already asked um, because I do have these so many pieces hundreds and hundreds of pages I don't know what to do with and your and the way you went about doing yours um, 
actually actually looks only a light one. Oh yeah, Eureka! That's that makes perfect mm -hmm. sense because I'm um, many I want to say years away from reaching that part. But <laughs> I really appreciate everything that you said and thank you for sharing your life uh, with us. I know it's so hard to be. It's very hard to be vulnerable. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jordan, for inviting us all here. Oh, yeah. oh, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much, Gail. And um, thanks to those of you who popped in. I will gently encourage you to <laughs> go have lunch or something because we can move on to our critique. But um, Gail, <laughs> if you would like this recording for any reason, I will send it to you as well. It can okay, be fun to have. You. So Definitely. thank you so much. And um, sure. thank you so much. Love you. <laughs> and uh, you we'll be in touch. Okay, wonderful. And I wish all of you the best of luck with your writing. I'm so grateful I was able to hear some of it today. And yeah, just know that I'm cheering for all of you. Thank you, my friend. Have a great uh, what day are we? Rest of your week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you too. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. You thank you. Bye. Um, so for the rest of us, do you guys, uh, does anyone need like a couple minute break? Do you have to go to the bathroom or anything? Yeah. Okay. I'll let you do that. Yeah. Stuart. I have one comment, if I may, before yeah. we dive in, just following up before I forget, because I, yeah, yeah. Uh, following up on your question, um, one of the things I had an aha this weekend as I was writing, and I don't know if it would be helpful, but in my memoir, I've come to realize a lot of what I'm dealing with is my father and the relationship and da da da. I, I came, the epiphany was, you know, he did the best he could do with what he had. Mm -hmm. And so rather than continuing to be critical of him, I yeah. took it a different way. And there's also something that I learned a long time ago, reading some stuff from Deepak Chopra. And he talks about um, observation versus evaluation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of what Gail was mm -hmm. talking about observation is stating the facts evaluation is putting your own spin your own on opinion it. Yeah. And, and it really helps to differentiate when i think about it like that that's a good point yeah and and i liked her point about vulnerability that if you're being vulnerable at the same time as you're you're talking about other people's behavior it's more likely to come across as well we're just messy humans than like i have it all together and they're just a mess <laughs> um there's also, I think, understanding people's motivations, that whole idea that they were just doing the best they could. Like, we can still unequivocally say, if you beat your child, that's not okay. But if we understand that you were beaten and that that was the like worldview in which you were raised, we at least can, can see that person as less of a monster and more as broken by their own upbringing. And I think that's really important when we are writing about the difficult people in our lives, that we understand the motivation or the, or the sh things that shape them to be how they are absolutely as well as understanding what yeah. shaped us so yeah um yeah ref um you know i i kind of waited i'm I, I i'm happy i'm really like the words that you, what, what's going on with the words that you're saying you know <laughs> and i kind of waited to start this memoir of mine until i was coming from a place of compassion mm. that i understood you know that he he did do the best that he could but he mm -hmm. had so many uh, incapabilities that had nothing to do with him. It was, this, you know, the, the mental setup, the whatever it was that that's all he could do. Yeah. He couldn't do what I could do. And, and when I come from compassion, then I can present it in a totally different way. It's mostly from my point of view and, you know, and it was my fault for falling in love. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, it's, no, a, I know it's a different, it's a different take on, on the whole story. Yeah, it, exactly. So, um, all right, well, let's take, I didn't mean to cut you off, but let's take no, just like okay. a two minute run to the bathroom for those who need to, and we'll come back and talk about Susan's piece. Yeah, I need, I need a tissue to wipe my nose from where <laughs> okay, I'll be right back. back.
right, well, whenever you're back, I'm back. That was great. I'm so glad that she came to talk to us. I'd like to try and do more of that, like having guest guest speakers as often as possible, even if it's not something we've read. So. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it's just nice to get someone else's perspective for a change. Get tired of hearing myself talk. <laughs> <laughs> but she's such a um, generous person in, in person as well. I met her, I met her years ago. I used to do a, um, I'm trying to think if I met her, I used to do a volunteer like radio show, a literary radio show. I think I might have met her there. So I interviewed her or it might've been for a magazine. I forget which, but I interviewed her. And then we just kept in touch and then, you know, Facebook came around and then we got to sort of see more of each other's lives. And then I got to, every time we go up to Tahoe, I'd go up and meet her and she's just such a lovely person. And there's an essay of hers actually that isn't in any of her books. I'm going to share it in our group. Um, that's written right at the end of her marriage, her first marriage to her first husband. Um, and it's all about kind of how she had to break up with his family who she loved so dearly and it's before her mother's death it's one of the best things i've ever read so i'll, I'll share that with uh with the group all right are we all back yeah i think i think peggy's calling in because i know she's got something going on i'm not sure peggy are you able to talk or are you only in listening mode possibly just in listening mode okay oh did it i can't hear me yeah oh i'm I'm here. I'm sitting in the hospital parking lot, so uh, okay, I'm kind of unprepared, unprepared for writing or anything. But um, I know, but I'm it's here. Okay, you can you can just be a listener today if you want. Okay, I know you're but you're helping a friend I'm, out. So, all right, well, yeah, we're glad and, you're um, here. I don't know. I do know how to mute to unmute, but not to how to mute myself. Oh, I can mute. mute the background. Okay, I'll do it for you. Okay, so I'm going to mute you now, okay. but you unmute if you need to. All right, so. Great. Well, so we're going to talk about Susan's great piece today and who is feeling like going first. And remember, let's start with the heat, what we loved, what works for us. And then, yeah, Chris. Uh, hold on. Somebody's trying to call me. Of course. How annoying. Okay. Um, wow. Uh, just the whole um, topic. I'm I'm an adoptive parent, and so reading about that really touched me on a personal level. And um, my situation is an open adoption as well. Um, the places that were the more most powerful for me were when um, the writing was in scene. Uh, for example, when the um, narrator sees a picture of the, um, the potential parents with the uh, baby and just looking at the father and his trepidation and the mother and her caring and that moment for me is so powerful. And um, I think that's where the writing is the strongest is when I want to be there. I want to be in the room and seeing what's happening. I, I'm, I want to experience it along with the narrator. Um, and so I had a couple of questions um, like, um, well, I'm an interpreter. So this is <laughs> really interesting to me. The part about the narrator being unable to verbalize yet. And how does it feel to have your parents verbalizing for you or interpreting for you? And that's something, I mean, that you may or may not want to explore, but as an interpreter, I was really interested in it because I spent a lot of time making other words for other people. <laughs> and it's weird. It's a weird relationship, um, especially if I'm not neutral. Uh, when I go, I, I'm not a good interpreter for my family because I have an idea of what they should and shouldn't say. And I just want to edit the heck out of them. So I just wondered what that experience was like not being able to, to verbalize and especially as a writer, you know, not being able to express oneself is a, is a big deal. Um, the moment of seeing Melissa for the first time, I want to know more about that. Just, you know, that moment where you're beholding your child 
um, for the first moment is a huge moment. And I wanted to, I want more depth about that. There was some beautiful writing about it, but I wanted to hear more about that. And then also, um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, that was my main thing. I sent you a bunch of comments in a document, but I, those are the things that I wanted to add to that. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Questions? All right. Who would like to go next? Stuart. So um, having read a number of things through the classes that relate to this story and, and, and the memoir, I had some broader context, I think, and, and details. Um, what I wanted to, what, what worked for me was um, the, the story is obviously so powerful. And I think following up on what Chris said, so much of it, um, you know, like the, the, the scene with the, uh, the adoptive parents and so forth, um, it, it just really, uh, it, it hits you. There, there's so much in here um, that, that it, was, it was just incredible to try and figure out, okay, uh, I got hit by a truck while riding a bicycle home and I said to myself, I want more. Now I knew more because I had read, but I'm, I wasn't sure um, how this piece would fit in with the broader uh, memoir. So um, I was looking for, okay, I, I would like more details or um, getting pregnant. Um, I started to ask myself, how did the narrator get pregnant? Um, you know, well, uh, because it wasn't in here. So at, as I went through this, there were a lot of places where I said, I'd like to hear more details. Um, the story is powerful. And, um, and I love the, the fact that it starts out with the Costellos. Um, and that, that really grabbed me and said, okay, what is it about the Costellos? Now, I don't learn about the Costellos to late, but it, it held my attention throughout the whole uh, writing to find out who are the Costellos and why are they a blessing? Um, the one thing, and I think this somewhat relates to what Chris said, what, what I felt, and I'm not going to, and maybe I'll send a, a separate document and point these specific things out, but in general, what I found is I would like to hear about how the narrator felt. Uh, there were so many places that I said, um, you know, like at the point where it says, um, as shocking as that discovery was to everyone, including me, it was decided I could and, and go through, uh, we'd go through the pregnancy. Well, how did that feel? How, you know, I, was, I wanted to hear how it feel. Or I decided to give my baby up for adoption for many reasons, but I said to myself, gosh, how does, how does that feel? Um, you know, obviously not being a woman and not having had that experience, but uh, there, there has to be a lot of emotion there. Um, the other thing that I was looking at is that open adoption, and obviously uh, it sounds like Chris knows, I didn't know what open adoption was, and I would have liked to have heard a little bit more about what that is relative to all the uh, adoption possibilities. So uh, those, are, those are my key comments, um, again, uh, the story is so powerful. Um, when I when I read these uh, pages, I said, this could probably be, uh, you know, I could see it as 25, 30 pages, <laughs> just from what the, this content is in terms of the stories and all the major kinds of events that occurred in here. So those are uh, my thoughts. And, uh, you know, I, I really, I, I look forward to seeing the continuation of this play out. Thank you, Stuart. All right, my friends, who's next? Natani and then Rev. Um, I, 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 I'm also an adoptive parent and I really enjoyed reading this perspective um, from a, a mother. And uh, the heat for me was um, the emotion behind finding the right family for your for your daughter and um, that it, it felt divine. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would really, as somebody who is not religious, I would really like um, to feel more um, of what you were feeling and in that divinity. Um, I, because I, you know, there's, there's grace of God that, that that term gets used a couple of times and I want to know what that feels like as somebody who doesn't <laughs> feel that kind of stuff. Um, I also really felt like uh, the heat was uh, this 
this juxtaposition of this need to care the to care for the narrator's baby and find the right family for them while also rebuilding and repairing a body and that um i, I feel like i wanted kind of like stuart said like i feel like this could be 20 30 pages like each paragraph could have been expanded uh into its own page or few pages um I, I loved the photograph thing too. Um, and sometimes you just know when you when you catch a, a moment uh, of someone in their their raw state, you're like, oh yeah, that that's the right person. And I, I really thought that it was beautiful. I just kind of each I read it a few times, and each time I read it, I felt like the beauty just kind of came out of it more and more. Um, they they were the right religion, and they also had German heritage and um i just i don't know it was very heartwarming and um uh, as an adoptive parent who does not have an open adoption i this is the kind of situation i wish my daughter could have and i think it would be really healing for other adoptive parents who uh, were maybe in the foster adopt situation and their children don't get to know their birth families it's it's nice knowing that it works out well <laughs> for some people and it's it doesn't have to be a tragic story for everybody that it can be very healing and happy and you know it's so great that that your daughter has these two families that love her so much and i think that was really the key for me just there was it was just filled with love mm -hmm. for her um so that was really nice thank you for sharing it Thanks, Natani. All right, Rev. Yeah, I'm going to piggyback on what everybody's already said. I mean, the story is so unique and so ripping on its own that that um, I just want to hear a lot more details and a lot more. I want to see the inner struggle between I'm a mother. I've never given up anything I've owned. I, I get attached to an eight dollar piece of something that I get from the charity shop. So how you know, and I imagine how difficult it is to say, I can't, I can't do this. I, I have to give her up. I want to hear about that. I want to hear the gut wrenching, you know, and, and the other part is to lie in a body that's not functioning. If then the thoughts are going, that's an incredible amount of both stress and, and, um, sadness and and all a slew of emotions that that I would love to go on that journey because I would I couldn't I I don't want to go on, a, on the physical journey you know I I don't want to be in that position and I support the narrator but I would like to 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 have a door open and see what it's like on the inside both with the adoption both with letting the go and both with being just the contrast between being physically saying to yourself, I'm physically unable to do this and I'm going to give it to somebody else. That's a lot of emotions under the bridge. And I just like to hear, yeah, I, you know, 40 page thing wouldn't, wouldn't throw me in the least, you know, for this, just this little, you know, um, I'm crying just thinking about it, you know, anyway, but that's, you know, the, the story has to be told and, you know, and, and I want to hear it. I want to read it. Um, but I want to go through those dirty, dark tunnels with, with the narrator. Thank you. Thanks, Rev. <clears throat> um, Peggy, am I assuming you're going to send your comments by email or did you want a chance to talk? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I didn't prepare my um, okay. my response, but um, I just am thrilled with the story the way it is. And um, I, Susan, I hope it's okay if I email you again um, my 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 critique. Yeah. Oops, sorry about that. Yes, it's that she's giving you a nod. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Thanks, Peggy. <laughs> okay. I love. I just it. wanted to make sure I wasn't cutting you off. So good thank you good well thanks everyone for your comments um susan it's great to see this piece and to see it again because i know we saw an earlier draft and i can tell 
the work that you put in on this piece from the last set of comments. So it's right. like, I am excited to see what the next draft is going to look like because you are so, um, yeah, just, I could just really, I really appreciated what you did from the last version. And I feel similar to what many have said in terms of the heat being, you know, there's, there's something about your narrative writing voice that is very persistent and vulnerable and resilient and sweet. There's just this light in your narrator. There's a light in your narrator that I always admire. And, and I think that because of that, it's almost like the narrator is the, that we are reading is perhaps the, the woman your narrator is today. And sometimes we crave that we want to be with the narrator when she was going through, perhaps she wasn't yet fully integrated into her, you know, faith and her acceptance and her whatever she's had to go through to get to where she is. So it's like, maybe we want more of that voice of innocence um, in the moment. And it's, I always feel bad. Like we're saying, give us more pain, <laughs> give us your pain, Susan. <laughs> yes. But in a way we're saying we, we can take it. We, we, um, it will help us understand your narrator even better. But mm -hmm. I also respect that it's up to you to, to, to decide how much of that you want to share because it, it's so personal and so um, it's vulnerable, you know, it's very vulnerable. Even though I still think your narrator is vulnerable, she comes across as vulnerable. Um, yeah, so it's that tension where we like, we like her voice now, we wanna know what she was going through. And I, I also feel like your writing really comes alive in those scene moments where you're using dialogue and you're putting us in a setting and there's um, kind of action of some kind. Uh, it really just wakes up in a way that, you know, all of our writing does, right? That's just what scene writing does. It, it activates us, it engages us. And I think um, I love some specific points. Um, I also really felt there was like a, oh, maybe one or two lines where I really felt some empathy, some deep empathy for your narrator because she describes herself as broken or her body as useless. And those were to me like the first little hints at maybe what else she's feeling besides just gratitude to have found this family. So I think we can handle more of that if you're willing to go there. Um, and I don't know if, how much prior to this in the narrative, you might've already done that. So again, it, it's hard to tell based on what little we've read. Um, but I also, I liked what Natani had to say about not everyone has such a deep experience of faith. And so if for your narrator to reveal what that feels like, maybe it feels like having, um, you know, a parent who's always there for you, but is not a parent, it's God, right? You know, like if there was some way to, to use analogies or something to describe what that feels like, I think that would be really compelling because I'm always really attracted to people of strong faith because I have wishy-washy in my faith. <laughs> um, but it's like, I want to I want to have a strong faith. So I love reading about other people's. Um, but yeah, it's just, your, your story is in and of itself gripping. And then I also felt like, what everyone else is saying, it's that taffy metaphor, right? I want you to slow and stretch and pull that story out wide. I often say zoom in, by which I mean like slow down and then just like give us that moment in as much detail as you can. And so if you have any reservations about like, oh, maybe I'm telling too much or like just ignore those reservations and know that you can give us like 360 degree view of this story and we will be right there with you the whole way. So it's, you know, it's really good. So that's all I have to say. So how about you, Susan? Anything to respond? Where's my notebook? My desk is so messy, I lost my notebook. Uh-oh, we lost your face. Silly little. There you go. And you're also on mute still, Susan. I don't know if you can tell. It's with us. This is my one complaint about Zoom. It's like, it should be so simple. It should be able to just hit a button and be unmuted. I know you're there, Susan, trying to get to us. <laughs> just wanna let you know that we still can't hear you. Um, while we wait for Susan to log on, we will, there's her face. There's her face. <laughs> All 
All right, we got that back. Yeah. Now we just got to get your sound. Oh no, it's not being friendly today. <laughs> Dang it. Also, I'm going to email out the quote. I had Gail email me the quote she read from Audrey Lord. I'm going to put that. We see you, Susan. There you are. Oh, you had it unmuted there for a second. <laughs> I swear. Yeah, so that quote is really beautiful. I love and um, I'll send out the recording. And once we get to hear from Susan, we'll do we'll check in on goals. We'll do both past and set new ones all at once <laughs> before we log off. Um, oh, I'm sorry it's giving you trouble, Susan. Okay. You're unmuted, but but we can't see you, but you're unmuted, so maybe just that's good enough. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. No, the reason I don't verbal first of all, thank you all very much for your input. I wrote it all down. Good. Okay. No. All of the reasons I, my parents verbalized for me and they did not bother me is because I had a message board in which I would point to letters to make words for that to speak for me. Mm, that's cool. And thankfully, I'm an excellent speller. Nice. That's cool. But I think that's worth including in your story, that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. method. Okay. Yeah. And then I will, I will add detail about my relationship with the birth father later okay. or earlier in the story. Got it. Awesome. And uh, I couldn't add emotion to my while writing the first couple tracks. Because it was too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I can understand and that. And also, there were the emotions may not have been present, or they weren't present because. I had to come out of a five-month coma. Wow. When I interviewed the parents. So I really don't remember ha having emotion. Mm. That's powerful. I get it. So it's like a blur to you. Right. Yeah. I wonder if your family members remember you expressing any emotion. That might be worth asking if you want to include it. Well, my mother had passed on. And my father is not the one who expressed mm. emotion. Mm. Mm -hmm. And they were the only two present. Mm. It's tough. Yeah. So you're really in an interesting situation there because you can't remember and they may not want to explore it. So well, ju just as a recommendation, and then I'll let some others weigh in. Um, you might try doing an, uh, here's what I imagine I was feeling. As like almost like a an, almost like a poetry exercise or a, like a right. free right. writing like 
I don't know what I felt, but I, given who I am as a person or who I was here. So that's just a thought, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. Chris, you have your hand up and then Rev. I do have my hand up because I think that in and of itself, not being aware of having emotions about that is powerful because these powerfully emotional things are happening and that the narrator in the post coma state is not able in that moment to have emotions about something that's going to impact her life and this child's life. That's enough for me as a reader, enough said, because then I'm having the emotions for the narrator. But just knowing that the narrator was not processing things emotionally in that moment, that's very interesting to me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rev, and then Stuart. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I mean, that that's very powerful that, that you're kind of like, your mind is in limbo. But then like what you said, uh, uh, Jordan, that take a step back and write from the perspective of now, mm -hmm. you know, which is what I find myself doing a lot because I can't remember everything, mm -hmm. you know? And then I can imagine though what I would imagine if I was in that kind of a place. I mean, giving up my daughter and, you know, being in a, in a broken, imagine it now and, and, and play it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of options, Susan. Yeah, uh, Stuart? Yeah, uh, I agree with what you're, what you're all saying. And I think that would be powerful. And that would fill in for what I was describing as the need for more emotion. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't know how this could be linked in, Susan, but um, as the narrator talks about faith, um, this to me is possibly a situation where the emotions can't be remembered. Uh, however, the faith can be. And it's almost where yeah. the faith took the place of any emotion to help guide the narrator through this whole sequence of events. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Susan, do you have any more comments before we set our goals? Oops, you muted yourself, sweets. There you go. I want to thank you all so much. I was thinking, taking many, many notes on what you told me about this. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing it with us. I always love reading these pieces of your story. So good work, everybody. All right, so what we're gonna do is I'll tell you what your last week's goal was, tell us how you did, and then set a new one so we can finish up. And then um, Natani, you're up next, I believe. Does that sound right to you? Okay. All right, um, Susan, let's see here. Sorry, let me find, <laughs> I left, I lost your, our page. Okay, Susan, you were going to, <laughs> sorry, still not on the right page. Work on your, oh, your COVID coffee piece. Oh, I got that done. Okay, good. And then what's your goal for this week? Um, rewrite the uh, um, cocktail piece with all your suggestions. Well, I can remember them. <laughs> good, good goal. Awesome. All right, um, Natani, you are gonna have a solid start for your money essay. How'd it go? Um, the writing is still bad, but today's prompt, I think gave me some, a good, a better jumping oh. off point than where I was going before. So that, nice. yeah, sometimes those trigger words just really- No, right? I loved yeah. what you wrote today, so that's excellent. Thank you, yeah, and I don't know if my submission, I think it's next. Yeah. Um, if it's going to be the piece that I'm, sub the essay that I'm submitting for Moolah or more of the memoir, I, okay. I don't, whatever comes out. <laughs> Is that your goal or do you want to set up? A, a specific... Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> decide, decide what you're going to submit and submit it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Two part goal. You got it. Yeah. All right. Uh, Rev, you were going to continue working on your chapter. How'd that go? Oh, you're muted. Uh, 
I continued. I'm not working at uh, Nick, you know, at high speeds, but it's moving along. Good. And I've taken a week off. I'm in, I'm, I'm in LA right now, and I went on a retreat this weekend. And I think all that just helps. When I get back, you know, by the weekend, I should be energized and keep writing. Good. So is that your goal, just to keep writing? Yeah, absolutely. It's always my goal. <laughs> okay. Um, Chris, you weren't here last week, but um, want to report on anything and then set a goal for this week? Uh, I wrote the Daisy Chain chapter, which is where we ended up last class. Nice. So um, this week I'm going to, I actually ended up splitting it. So I'm going to write the second half of that chapter. And also um, you uh, posted on Facebook this essay about writing. And one of the things she talked about was collecting things, even if you don't know why, Yeah. Uh, for your memoir. And I, that really appeals to me um, because I do things organically and intuitively. And so I'm going to keep collecting things that uh, seem related, even though I may not know how they're related. I like that. That's really great. Um, and Stuart, you're going to set up the beginning of your memoir. Uh, yes. And uh, I actually did that, although it has been painful. Mm. I had, I was, I was besides myself trying to figure this out. And last night, late last night, I had an aha, oh, and good. I wrote this morning. Good. So I have a start that I, 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 I need to test it out and see whether or not I'm feeling good and on track. And then for next week, uh, if it is on track, build it out. Okay. But, but so I that, to, is that your goal then to, to build out that next week is to figure out whether this is directionally the right way I want to go. And then if it is build it out and refine it. Is the new beginning direction. All right. Well, thanks everyone. I'm glad we got to have Gail. I'll send out the recording later and Natani, just you send me your piece when you figure out which one you're sending. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you. Thank you for arranging to have Gail. I know I probably say this on behalf of everybody. I can't tell you how much I learned from her today and how much it was helpful to hear her process of how she went through getting to where she finally had what she felt was the right memoir. Uh, that, well, that, was that is my goal is to keep trying to bring up people to class. Um, at least I, I will love, I'd love to bring one other person this session. And of course, if I, I'm trying to pick books, if possible, where I can invite the, the author or invite someone who could talk, talk about a similar topic. So that's my goal. Cause I think it really is nice to have that extra voice. Yeah. It was great class. Good. Very, well, I'm very, so glad. For she, me, it was very emotional. Yeah, well, she's a wonderful speaker and writer, and I just think she brings a lot of vulnerability. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you liked it. Good. Well, thanks, everyone, and I will see you next week. Okay. Bye. 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 Thanks.